So I'm going to just take a second and sum up a couple of things and then focus on one more specific topic before we have a little discussion. So Brian talked about the overview, the world where we need to be more engaged with our customers. We talked about um, the idea of engaging our customers, our audiences in reviews and customer service. We talked about the idea of using so your social ecosystem um, uh, to benefit search and search to benefit the social ecosystem. What about content? How are you going to interact with people? Lots of brands, lots of companies got started with social because of the idea that they could interact with people essentially for free in Facebook. That you would post something and it would be broadcast out to however many of your followers. Facebook's made this much more difficult because now when you post something it only goes to about 16% of your followers. But actually that was never a very good model anyway. Because that was just taking the old broadcast model of communications and bringing it into social media. The temptation is to do the same in Twitter as well. And the question I think we have to ask ourselves going forward is how can we actually use social to the purpose that it promised us? The opportunity to engage, to have conversations with people. And I think this is where content becomes really important. And where the shape of your organization, to Glenn's point about blame the CEO, becomes incredibly important. So for me, the key to social success at the moment is about your ability to, to, to create, produce, publish content in real time and then interact with people in real time. And the question is, how do you do that? Well, in my experience, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm lucky to work with a firm that does a lot of work with British Airways. And for them, the, the question is, how can we interact with people today, both to the benefit of those customers and also to, our, to us for a business, from a business point of view. So we sit down each morning at 10 o'clock, we look at what's happening today, both in the news and also from the brand's point of view, and what people are talking about. What are people saying to us? What are people saying about us? Then we have a team that goes away and they say, okay, these are gonna be the two, three, two or three key things that we produce interesting bits of content. We create visual content. We have designers who take photography or use photography to create cool social posters that drive sharing. And at the same time, there are people who are interacting in real time with people who are having issues, who are asking questions. The question for you is, how do you operationalize that? How do you make that possible and achievable in your organization? Well, of course, to Glenn's point, it requires some buy-in from senior management, right? It requires some engagement from people who can make, make it easier for you to have the resources, time, and also the license to have those interactions. So I think one of the key questions for us going forward is how do we organize ourselves to do that? And I think the example that Glenn showed about knocking down those silos about saying, you know what, this isn't about marketing, this isn't about PR, this isn't about digital, this isn't about the search optimization team, this isn't about the media agency or the PR agency. This is about finding the best ideas and putting a system in place that's operable to publish those in real time. So my message, my short message to sum up is, ditch the content calendar. Look for ways that you can create content in real time for your brand. And I think that's tricky for a lot of brands to master. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about it on the panel. Um, so we've had some good questions come in via Twitter. I've got one more person to introduce, if that's okay. Uh, and that is Dr. Hashim Al-Badri, uh, excuse me, who's the communi Corporate Communications Director at Sudatel, um, which is the telecommunications group in the Sudan. Uh, welcome. Um, what, we're all going to get up, so we're going to move on to the panel bit of the discussion. Um, so we want to take some questions from you guys, and I, hopefully there's some people circulating. Oh, there's microphones down the front, aren't there? So we want to take your questions. I've got a couple from Twitter for the team. Come on, guys, let's, let's get up and wander around, I think. Um, it's a big stage, lots of space to fill. Um, so if it's okay, I want to start with a question for um, Hashim, who's joined us, um, as I said, from the Sudan, because I think from a social point of view, Africa is a really interesting place at the moment. Hashim, what, what would you advise big international companies who are thinking about Africa, who are gonna come in 
um, and want to think about their, so their own social footprints there. Um, what should we do to connect with audiences in your part of the world? And then guys, what we'll do is we'll just generalize that and talk about uh, lessons learned from that and how we can apply them elsewhere. Please. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, as the boss said, my name is uh, Hajm Al Badri. I'm from uh, Sudan. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today and uh, to discuss this very important and vital issue. Uh, the social media in Africa, it's, it's, it's very similar to social media in everywhere. But considering that, Africa, it has a different circumstances. Just like the uh, war here and there, the poorness, which is covering uh, many areas in Africa, uh, the lack of uh, internet uh, networks, which is not covering most of the African countries. I think uh, we have many challenges in Africa to uh, spread out the social media networks. I'll talk a little bit about Sudan and uh, our experience in Sudan in the terms of social media networks. Uh, we have around uh, 10 millions of uh, inter internet users in Sudan. Uh, most of them the, they are access the internet through their phones and smartphones. Uh, the companies in Sudan, the telecom companies in Sudan, they are uh, working very hard to uh, gain more customers in their social networks, especially the Facebook. The Facebook is ranking now in Africa as a first uh, stage and with uh, more than 70% of the internet users. In Sudan, we have a similar situation. Most of the uh, internet users, they are using Facebook as a main uh, gateway or challenge channel for the uh, social media. Uh, we have many issues in Sudan, just to, to let you know that, uh, to know the real, the real picture of the social media in Sudan, we have to know that uh, the challenges are facing the Sudanese companies or uh, service providers is how to be close to the customers, how to be close to internet users and social media uh, users. In Sudan, for example, from company, my company Sudatel, uh, we have now in our Facebook uh, page of the company like uh, 160,000 of li likes. And uh, in the last occasion, in the Eid of Muslims, as you know, we are Muslims and we have to celebrate of two Eids, uh, one of them, the last Eid, and we have to cluttering uh, sheep. We provided our uh, participants in the Facebook with a gift. Just we drop a question, simple, very simple question, and ask them, ask them to answer this question with a uh, big prize. We provide them with a sheep. Just look for the... Sorry, was that a sheep? Yes, sheep, yes. So. You're going to provi you're providing them. Are you actually providing them with a yes, sheep? Yes, it's actually a sheep. It's the cost of a sheep. Right. Okay. If you answer the, right, the question, you will have the cost of the sheep. Okay. Sorry. Has any brand in here done a sheep giveaway on Facebook before? That's brilliant. Yeah. And through this way, we should uh, we see we saw that we will be very close to our customer. Why? Because they are thinking about this gift all the time of the eight. So now we're being very close to our customer by dropping some ideas like this. I have many things to say, but... Uh, That's brilliant. Thank you very much. This is a fantastic, good place to be in. So guys, if you've got a question, come, please come down the front here. There's a microphone this side, a microphone this side. Frankly, I'm much more interested in hearing from you guys than continuing to talk. So um, come down and, and throw a question or two at us. And, and if that doesn't work, I'll, I'll start picking on people from the audience. 
In the meantime, guys, question for you. Okay, so this is the thing everybody wants to know, right? So we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, when we think about um, uh, brand social footprints. Are there platforms that you think are up and coming that are particularly interesting? If I'm a brand, if I'm a corporation, if I'm a company thinking about engaging with people in social media, where should I be, what should I be thinking about? Who wants to go first? Glenn. Thank you. Uh, well, you know what, I think the thing we all need to be focusing on is the thing that we don't know about yet. You know, this world changes too quickly. Uh, I could say mobile, you know, yeah, it's important, but um, actually it's, it's making sure, you know, from an organizational perspective, you have the team around you, not necessarily internally, could be externally, that is completely on the pulse of what's coming next. Um, you've got to be prepared to fail. You've got to be prepared to change, uh, try a lot of things. Um, there's, a, there's a great YouTube video uh, produced by the Coca-Cola company called um, uh, Liquid Content. Google YouTube liquid content and you'll find it. Um, and, and I think yeah, that's my message. Actually, don't worry too much about what's there today. Uh, look at what's potentially coming in the future and get ready for it. Brian, quick one and then we've got a question over here. Okay. Uh, hello. Testing. Oh, brilliant. Um, to, to Glenn's point earlier in his discussion around breaking down the silos, I think it's not only about the social networks that are externally facing. Right? Uh, previously, before f Facebook, it was MySpace and Friendster and all of these other ones. I think what we need to start looking at is, uh, in terms of this digital experience, it's also about the inside. Right? So things like uh, IBM Connections that allows you to bring these social networks in-house and allowing you to break down the silos between organizations so that you're collaborating better, especially when you have a lot of the millennials coming in. A, uh, c millennials and Generation Ys starting to collaborate and starting to come into the workforce. You got to start thinking about some of these pieces and possibly giving sheep to your employees. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Let's get a question from down here, please, sir. There's no microphone. Right. <laughs> Can I borrow somebody's microphone? <laughs> Thank you. Please, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karim Saikali from ecomlebanon.com. My question goes to Roberto from Acer. Uh, how do you actually manage to get your customer testimonials and feedbacks about your products? Like, do you contact them? And if you do, do you offer, in, uh, do you offer an incentive for that? And what is the response rate? Because usually if you send out like 100 uh, uh, emails for customer testimonials and you have very few people who get back to you on that. So how do you actually do that with your customers? Yeah, I assume you're, as you're saying that testimonial meaning they leave a review in the discussion I've been before. Yeah. Sorry, let's go. OK, so of course, of course. So basically, we invite every single customer that registered their machine to leave a review. So as soon as they register, we send them an email by saying, dear customer, we hope you're having a, a good time with your new Acer product. Uh, we would like you, uh, you to help other customer uh, with the, the everything you think about the product you bought. Go to Revu. So we are basically just contacting them to suggest them to go uh, to Revu, and they will basically start the engagement with the Revu platform. You don't see me anymore. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and we have a response rate of 10%. So we have a lot of people that really um, engage. We are very clear. Your, your review will never be touched by Acer. This is a third-party company, and your, your opinion will be evaluate, evaluated and published on the site. No incentive. Brilliant. Do we have other questions from out here? Anybody? Well, I've got one from Twitter, which I think is great, and it's a question for Hashim. Hashim, in Sudan, in Africa, and guys, let's all take a quick one at this. How do you use social media to build trust with your audiences? Uh, one of the main issues to build trust uh, to our audience is to talk frankly with them about the problem of the company. One of the main issues that we noticed uh, through the last year, many of the problems in the network has been arised through the social media networks. And one of the main issues that is to open a conversation or direct conversation with our customers, our, 
our uh, customers in the uh, social media channels and told them the real situation of, the, of your products and services. So uh, we are trying to do many things regarding to uh, enhance our uh, performance in social networks. Uh, actually, uh, it's all about trust. If the customer trusts you, uh, actually will hear you. If not, then it's waste of time to talk to him through any channels, social channels or any other channels. So the only way I think it's uh, to speak frankly with customers through different channels of uh, social networks. So brilliant. So let's pick up the trust theme, guys. How, how do we use social media to build trust? So, sorry, take Go a ahead. step. Um, I, I think that being able to participate in a conversation and being able to be there and be a real person is very, very important. So if you think about large enterprises, let's just take IBM for example, 400,000 people, how do you make that feel more personal? And I think through social media, when you start to see people respond and people start to talk and remove the, uh, the barriers and become more transparent, you start to build a trust and you start to have a conversation with, uh, with, with everyone out there. And I think that's one way that you can start to really build the trust is to not just push messages out there, but really start to listen. Guys? Yeah, I think um, it seems really easy, right? You know, how, why do big brands suffer with this? Uh, you know, surely it's easy. It's just about having conversations. We've been having conversations since we, you know, uh, came down from the trees. So why is it difficult now online? Uh, well, the answer to that is because big brands are used to having a monologue. Uh, and now, of course, they need to have a dialogue or even a trialogue, which is a conversation between you and many customers. So I think it's very easy, though, you know, what you need to do. Um, you know, I think everyone knows it. You've got to ask a lot of questions and you've got to answer a lot of questions. Regardless of some of those questions may seem stupid or benign, you must answer them. And of course, fleet of foot, speed. Um, if I ask a question today and the brand answers three days later, too late, too late. I bought something else, you know. Go back to the July the 4th thing. I mean, I was celebrating July the 4th on July the 4th. July the 7th, well, that's nice, but you know, it's not really engaging me. So I think it's all about questions. Answer them quickly and ask a lot of them too. And how do you guys build trust and how do you, how do you respond quickly? How do you make sure that you're, well, you're timely and staying on top of things? I, w I, w I, w I wish I could say all our countries are reacting the same way. Uh, being um, quite spread all over the world, we have different behaviors. So, as an example, Indone Eastern Indonesia won uh, the, the, I don't know, the title of uh, socially devoted company uh, for the IT industry by responding in 26 minutes, in average, to every single question. Then you go to Italy, no answer. So, we are trying to make this, so we, we want to learn even from our example of our, our single countries, uh, because of course, uh, those are really Acer. So we don't want to learn from others. We want to understand how Acer has to develop his, his way of engaging with customer. We are really relying a lot on the advocates because we have a lot of people that in discussion uh, in, on Facebook or on other, on other channel, they defend Acer, they push the Acer the values in front. So that's another point. So you also need to grow your advocates because those guys will be the guys that then will when asked, uh, we say, well, what's my best, uh, what's the best product I can buy? An Acer. Those guys are the result of being constantly growing your, your engaged fan base. Yes, I think also one of the main elements that can help you to build trust with your customer is, is listening. You have to listen more to your customer. More you listen, more you build a strong relationship with your customers. It's not only about pushing uh, news and uh, you know, things about your products, your services, we provide such and such, but it's all about listening to them, listening to, your, to their problems, what they are thinking about you. So I think listening also, it's uh, one of the main things that can help companies to build uh, trust with their customers. Cool. Questions from out here, please. I'm gonna start picking people at random. Yes. There's a mic coming to you now, I think. Hi. 
Uh, my name is Olga and I'm representing IT outsourcing company. And uh, my question is the following. Um, how I'm sorry? Um, do you think social media works for B2B and B2C company both well? Or maybe there are some industries that uh, might uh, use some other channels to communicate with their customers? Or social media is good for everyone? Somebody want to take that first? Well, yeah, let's say that uh, as an example, um, as we were mentioning before, channels are there, then you need to target your message depending on who you are, want to talk to. So people will be present in different channels and you need to be aware of who they are and what they, what's the language you need to use. So as an example, LinkedIn uh, is something we use uh, for engaging with uh, uh, businesses because, uh, of course, they, they might be our first level uh, customer. We are selling basically to stores, to shop, to chains. So this is uh, one channel that we use uh, in that case. So again, depends on the channel. Maybe uh, in this moment, LinkedIn is, one, is the channel for me for B2B. Uh, let's wait, other comes, but I wouldn't use Facebook for that. Yeah, so, so I'll just add to that. From, from my experience, actually, often the, the most interesting and powerful opportunities are in a B2B context. It's like we've said before, though, it's about understanding who is it, who is it that you want to talk to and where are they, where are they assembling. It's not about, I think we fall into the temptation sometimes of trying to get audience members to come to where we want them to be. And we've started creating social media embassies on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. And just like the website that we had before, we expect people to come to us and interact with us where we want them to. And I think that's a tremendous mistake. We have to understand where it is, especially in a B2B context, we have to understand where it is that the audience is having their conversations and then get permission to participate there and then add something of value. So often with B2B, from my experience, the best, the best platform is to engage with them in LinkedIn. But the only way to do that is truly one-to-one. -one. It's to have great content, it's to have great ideas that really add value to a conversation, but then to participate in that conversation. So yes, I think there's a big opportunity for B2B, but you have to do it in the right place in the right way. Brian. Uh, yeah, I think in the B2B space, uh, it's, it's very important because you got to be able to, to build the relationship between the two companies, right? You're working together. Um, and, but it has to be secure. And when I start to look at social, social media, social platforms, the things that I see that are very uh, uh, compelling are things like being able to notify, being able to share files, being able to uh, work through some of these things that are traditionally done over email or done face to face. But when you start to provide a social community in a secured manner and allow these two companies to collaborate together, then the fundamentals of social media, which is to be able to have a dialogue and have a conversation, becomes even more important. And not only that, but when you look at adding more B's to your B2B, right? Adding more businesses and more relationships, you need to be able to continue to have that knowledge retained somewhere, right? These processes. So what I'm looking at and what I think about is how do I start to merge some of these traditional business processes, onboarding a business, uh, business partner, or onboarding a, a, a subsidiary or, or something along those lines and make that more of a social business process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions out here? I guess the natural next question to that, guys, is, OK, what do you do when it goes wrong? So when you have a business problem that creates a tremendous storm online in social media, or you have a problem in social media that creates a tremendous storm, how do you deal with that? How do you react? I'll take that. Um, uh, one of my colleagues recently did a presentation on 10 social media crises, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and they can be very ugly. But, you know, I think it's, it's simple. It's, you know, w what we were doing 20 years ago from a PR perspective, it's still the same thing. You know, crisis management, it's still the same thing. It's just the only thing that's changed is the speed. Your thinking time 
has reduced from, ah, we got some bad press today, let's think about how we're going to respond in tomorrow's newspaper, to we got some bad press five minutes ago, um, and three minutes ago it kind of went viral, and we're now at the point where it's you know, global, so you've got to react incredibly quickly. But I think it's just basic, good, common sense. You know, react very quickly. And guess what you need to be able to react very quickly? A different kind of organizational structure to the one you possibly got today. And Glenn, you, you hit, as we were talking earlier, you also said something along the lines of fast failure, right? It's yeah. okay to fail. It's a, as long as you have that speed, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think in today's digital world, it's too easy to say, well, we'd better not do that in case it goes wrong. Um, you know, you've got to be prepared, prepared to fail or else I think you'll get left behind. Um, and uh, if you fail, that's okay. Just hold your hand up and say, you know what, we messed up. Um, there's plenty of examples uh, out there of social media um, that went wrong um, and they're very public examples because the brand took too long to fix it. Um, there's many, many more examples of social media campaigns that went wrong but aren't really in the news because the brand fixed it and fixed it pretty quickly. And generally it's by going, yeah, look, we're really sorry, we messed up, we shouldn't have done it, we're not going to do it again. And, you know, then it's, it's yesterday's news. Yeah, but, but this is probably also in the past ways, uh, you, you could always say something which was not true and uh, nothing would explode around that. In this moment, if you, if you respond by saying something not true, that will come back to you as a boomerang, which is something that with social spaces now is happening because people have the voice now. That's true, so it's true. It's a and, different approach. Uh, it, you know, and what I've seen some brands do is add a little humor to it, not just you know, a stoic PR response um, you know, from the board of directors, but yeah, make light of the situation you know, make themselves look a bit idiotic. Um, and that actually can then end up going, you know, social itself. Can every brand do humor, do you think? IBM uh, is horrible at humor. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we try, but... Uh... I don't know. Uh, I'd, I'd say the vast majority probably can. Um, your local funeral service parlor probably shouldn't. Um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say the majority can, but you know, there are some obvious candidates that absolutely shouldn't. Um. But I think, I think humor is just one, one way. The thing that I, I heard earlier was about compelling content. Yeah. And, and humor is just one way of making compelling content. Uh, there's other ways to, to drive dramatic uh, experiences. Great. We've got a question over here, please. Oh, there it is. Hello. Um, my name is Hubert. Um, I'm a social marketer and um, I'm a celebrity in Tehran called Mesa Taster. I'm going to different restaurants eating foods and stuff like that. Um, my question is, a couple of months ago, I had lots of reach, people reach on my Facebook. I've got 100,000 fans, but now it's going almost half. And I think it's Facebook to, to, uh, you know, doing some uh, paper click and stuff. I just got a question, what can I do with it? Because I've got different channels as well in YouTube, in Instagram, yeah. but my problem is with Facebook now, with 100,000 fans, I'm getting like 5,000 people reach for each post. Yep. So what should I do with it? I'll, I'll start on that one. Uh, this is a good question for Facebook. Um, but one of the things that they've said is that the, they are now sort of throttling or limiting the amount of reach that you get with each post to around 16% of your community on average, some a little more, some a little less. And the reason for that, I'm not sure Facebook would say it quite this way, but the reason for that is they want to force marketers to use more of their paid products. So given that so many marketers have invested in building Facebook communities, and there is value in those communities, obviously, or we wouldn't have spent all this effort building them, one of the things we need to think more about to the broader theme about breaking down silos, we need to think about uh, how we break down some of the silos between paid and earned and the content that we generate. 
So the short answer is if you want to continue to get large reach out of your Facebook community, you're going to have to begin to have a pool of resources available to you that you can dip into. When you have a piece of content that looks really interesting, really exciting, when you've published it and has a great initial response, can you then put some paid um, media spend behind that, whether that's in Facebook or elsewhere, to ensure that it gets the biggest possible reach? Now look, that's exactly the way Facebook wants us to behave. But there is benefit in it, because we're expanding our reach, the cost of doing so is relatively low, and when we do connect with somebody, when somebody does see the content that we're publishing and wants to interact with us, that of course is amplified to all of their friends and followers as well. So, you know, from my point of view, it's a little bit disappointing that we're now in this space where Facebook is limiting our ability to talk to the communities we've created, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it forces us almost to break down some of those silos that we've been talking about and make the paid element of what we do as important as the content generation. Guys, do you guys have thoughts on that as well? Well, uh, I did, but you, you already said what I was going to say, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> crap. I should have, you know. <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I do. Uh, sorry. Go on. Uh, I, I think that Facebook is just one place, right? Uh, and there were some articles about on CNN talking about some of the declines there. I think we really have to start thinking beyond just that one channel. And how do we start to... Uh, build out from the, that channel and start to reach in other places and then leverage things like analytics to be able to understand at a broader level uh, what my true reach is, not just from a Facebook perspective but all of these other places. So it, it's about starting to leverage some of those other places that your audience are going to and start to leverage some of that even more. Now right. the trick is how do you manage all of those different channels. Cool, we've got a question here in the fourth row. Thanks a lot. Aurimas from Lithuania. Um, I have a client who has, you know, this typical shopping cart with, you know, many products, etc., etc. Um, I really love the point that you made about, uh, you know, adding, um, you know, the, the, the reviews of, your, of, of the customers regarding the products that they had. Which, you know, option would you recommend? Um, a, embedding, embedding Facebook posts about the products that we, you know, used in, in social media uh, as, you know, below the products themselves in the, you know, in, in this, uh, in, in the cart. Or B, um, probably asking, like, you know, sending an email um, to, the, to the clients who purchased the product a week after the purchase, you know, to, to give um, sort of like, you know, a feedback, how they, you know, loved the product or, or, or hated it. So which option? Or maybe, you know, there's another solution. Let's we'll start, Roberto. There are, yeah, there are many options. Uh, I would say that uh, having a place where people can write immediately is not giving you the, the sense that people use that product. They, they, you, everybody can go there, no? I mean, there are situations happened recently even in my industry where Somebody was, was fine uh, paying people to write bad reviews. So uh, I, I think that the only pure, clean uh, way to get reviews is to contact the customer that for sure bought that product and ask him to leave a review. So that's my idea. Because otherwise, there is no point uh, that you can prove that the review is right. I completely agree. You, you've got to ask for that review once someone's properly had a chance to use it. So you know, if you're shipping it to them on the Monday, maybe ask them on the Friday. You know, you've got to give them a couple of days. And in terms of, you know, there's lots of third-party solutions out there for reviews. Um, and people often ask me, what should I pick? And my response is perhaps typical of someone who comes from a search background. I say, okay, in your local market, go to your local search engine, type in some big brands, and then the word reviews, and see what comes up. And if it's, you know, Revu, as, you know, or, or a trust pilot, yeah, pick, the one, pick the one that seems to be getting the most traction in your local market, and it will vary from market to market. Right, I think we've got time for one more, if there's one more. Yes. Hello, um, my name is Barry, and I'm a pharmacist uh, working as a content specialist um, in the pharmaceutical industry. So my question is about the quality of content. So speaking of content quality, do you believe that uh, having redundant content on different social media networks is a problem uh, in terms of um, 
brand quality or uh, reception of the brand value. Thank you. Somebody else well, want to start on that? For sure, for sure, for sure you want to have, uh, it can be redundant, but it has to be relevant to that particular space. So you, you don't need to, if you put a circle in a square, it doesn't fit. If the circle fits in the particular channel you want to put it, mm, feel free. The only point is that it must, be, it must fit well in that particular channel. Then for you, you never know where your audience will be. You try to reach them. Yeah, my question was actually, um, people usually from small businesses, they tend to paste and copy all the content all over the social media network. So in the, prob uh, in the future, is it going to be a problem in terms of SEO probably? Uh, well, it could be. Uh, I mean, duplicate content is one of the signals that Google looks at to see whether or not a site is trying to effectively game the algorithm. Um, but um, so what's key is, though, and one of the things that's looked at is where did the content originate from? If you're the origin of that content, um, then you're generally OK. However, I'd certainly, you know, if you're a big brand and you see lots and lots of companies effectively copying and pasting your content, um, then, you know, get in touch with them or get the legal department to get in touch with them. <laughs> I think particularly in the pharma world because it's dangerous. You know, I mean, if, if there's content that's redundant because it's the last ACER model, not the current ACER model, it's not going to cause any great problems. Yeah, if, it's if, the, if it's drug information, you know, then obviously there's other issues. It's all original review, so, but um, right. redundancy was the problem. Thank you very much. Okay. Any final thoughts, guys? I have an addition for the, the question of the gentleman here about the unlike in the Facebook uh, channel. I think uh, one of the issues that can uh, affect the, the continuously of the customer in the Facebook channel is it's about the content, the content that you provide to them. More the content is relevant to them, more they will stay with you. We, we noticed that last year we have unlikes, more, uh, a lot of unlikes in our customer uh, in Facebook channel, and we're starting to give them uh, something related to our business, related to, to the issues that they are care about. So, and after that, we start to keep the customers in the, in the Facebook channel. Uh, also, we give them some, you see, competitions like questions and prizes that, that I mentioned, and so they continue with us without uh, you see a major dropping in the number of Facebook channels. So Brilliant. it's all about the content. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to our panelists. Appreciate the discussion. Enjoyed it very much.